Hello everyone, welcome to another Voice Essentials live hangout and because I am uh, in the uh, southern hemisphere of the world, I get to say, before many of you, uh, many of you who are in the northern hemisphere, I get to say Happy World Voice Day a little bit sooner than most. The April the 16th is World Voice Day. It's a day where we celebrate uh, the fact that we're all, all born with this wonderful thing called a human voice. Um, and we talk about, you know, subjects like vocal health and uh, technique. And there are events happening all over the world and uh, not just here in Australia, but um, in, in a lot of the, the main regional centres, uh, as I said, all over the world. So everyone who's joining in today, happy World Voice Day. Of course, if you're watching this as a replay, it may, it may no longer be Happy Voice Day for you, um, uh, uh, given that you may be watching this um, after the 16th of April. But regardless, I hope you're having a great day and thanks for clicking on the video and watching it in replay. But of course, this is a live show. We do this show every Monday at 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And, uh, and so it is good to have everyone already joining in. We've got people jumping in. So we've got some new, new names here, some new people. Of course, we've got all the, all the old favourites. Well, I don't know that they're old, but uh, Matt's here. Uh, we've got Yahui and who are, so I've got uh, a whole range of other names that I've, I, I'm noticing. And Karen, of course, from Singwise and Linda who will be watching our live chat and just keeping everyone happy and healthy and safe in the live chat. If you um, are in the live chat currently, hey guys, uh, tell us where you're from, what is the weather like in your part of the world. We are having crazy hot weather here in Australia at the moment. It is a little, um, a little disconcerting. I heard on the news this morning that in Australia, certainly um, in Sydney, and I'm I'm about a thousand kilometres north of Sydney. So, but the the weather guy was saying that in Sydney they normally only have two or three days in April that go above the minimum goes above 18 degrees. There has not been a single day in Sydney where they haven't had their minimum stay above um, 18 degrees. It's just this hot weather seems to be coming a little bit more normal. Um, and so, hey, look wherever you are, let us know where you're from, what the weather's like. And uh, just so that we can get to know you. And uh, of course, later in the show, we'll do our Q&A. So now's the time to be talking about, to, to be asking your questions in the live chat. But of course, if you are watching this as a replay, then please take a moment to write your questions in the comment section, because I'll always do myself my very best to answer your questions, uh, regardless of whether you're watching this live or not, because I know there's a number of you who can't watch the show live because you're either it's asleep or you're at work or whatever when we go live, and, and I really appreciate the fact that the majority of you do watch this in replay. So, um, hey guys, just a little bit of um, uh, uh, channel news. Uh, we have just clicked past the two million view mark. And I shared that onto the Facebook page and basically said, that's a lot of eyeballs. Uh, so thanks to all of you who have supported the channel. Um, I know many of you who watch uh, these live hangouts um, have contributed to those views in a, a great way. And, um, and at around about the same time, we clicked into about 32,000 subscribers. So the channel is healthy and it's got a, a, a great sense of community about it. And it's in part to to you know, just the way you guys engage with the show here for the live event, but also the other uh, two videos that I've been releasing on a weekly basis on Wednesday and uh, and Wednesday and Friday. I had to think about that for a second. So it's very exciting. Of course, um, you know that this term, what we're doing for the next three months or so, I'm hoping it will go longer than that, but certainly for the next three months, I've got lined up every second Monday during the live show, we're having a guest on. Last week we had Michelle um, from faithculturekiss.com and oh, she was just wonderful. If you haven't seen that live hangout, jump onto my channel page and go to the videos just to be able to pull that video up to, to watch. She just shared so generously, there's so much wisdom uh, in discussing 
um, her approach to singing and and uh, you know uh, Linda said that she watched it a couple of times there's just so much in there and so I really encourage you to do that after today's live show if you've got time next week we are going to be having Kate Baker onto the show Kate Baker Kate is a, a jazz specialist but also works with rehabilitating voices and I know she's going to be able to come on and uh, share a lot of exciting things with us all so I'm looking forward to having her on the show I'm going to keep it a little secret as to who we've got coming up beyond there but I hope you can all join in uh, and tune in next week now today's show has to be a little bit shorter because this afternoon many of you know last year August the 11th a date that will remain forever etched into my uh, memory uh, my wife Jody was diagnosed with bowel cancer um, and we've been on a, a pretty big journey ever since um, and uh, she's on, undergone chemo she's completed the chemo process um, and so this afternoon last week I should just say last week Jody had her post chemo scans and blood tests and so this afternoon we are having our appointment with the with the um, oncologist and uh, we are going to find out you know um, where she is currently at and I wanted to update you all because all of you have been so kind and um, and so uh, intentional with your words of of encouragement and uh, and prayer and and uh, I just wanted to update you where we're at I might be able to let you know next week and give you an update um, we we're, we're anticipating a, a really positive um, outcome uh, we've been led to 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 to, to think that way um, and uh, and so we'll have that meeting this afternoon and uh, and but we you know I think I, I, I would be a robot to say so that we weren't you know a little bit on edge uh, with it all um, it was which was made a little bit worse actually funny story before we get into the rest of the show you know so we're a bit on edge with this with this meeting coming up but um, I was mowing my lawn, doing the lawns. I like to keep my lawns nice and presentable for, for students when they rock up here to the studio. I was mowing the lawn. I've done the lawn. I've mowed the lawn in the same way for the last 18 years. I always take my cars up onto the street, park them on the street, even though I do my, my nature strip out there. And I, I had finished doing the lawns and I came back up and I was just checking the front to make sure I hadn't left anything up there I look up and I see my daughter's new car well it's a second-hand car but her new car and and there is one side glass panel one window the passenger side door window completely smashed like shattered and I went oh no I've I've obviously I've kicked a, a stone up and it smashed the window now long story short I have I was currently uh, at that point I was also in possession of a uh, a loan car a courtesy car from a dealership that was loaning us the car because I've got I had my car in getting serviced and they gave us a loan car over the weekend and I my immediate thought was when I saw my daughter's window smashed in oh, I'm so glad that's not the hire car and I looked up and looked up the street to only see that I'd smashed a window in the loan car as well I I cannot tell you oh the moment that I saw that I'd done two windows in two separate cars the whole thing has cost me so much money and so stressful we're already a bit on edge with the with the impending meeting but there you go we got ourselves a, a, a a nice little bill to fix both of those windows but hey it's only money isn't it you know and I guess in, many, in the end we can all put it into perspective and right now our perspective is um, my wife's health and when I compare the thousand Australian dollars that I've had to fork out to fix both windows because you know it was my fault then um, then thousand dollars in the big scheme of life is probably not a big deal but I didn't need the stress to be frank uh, it was it was a little bit much but anyway I thought I'd tell you my sorry tale 
it wasn't a lot of fun. It was a little bit, well, it was definitely not a lot, <laughs> definitely not a lot of fun. Ah, let's get into today's show. We're going to be talking voice strain today. I hope you'll stick around. I've got a few things that we're going to talk through. Hopefully it's going to be a lot of help to you and I'm looking forward to the rest of the show. I'll see you soon. Sound check. Check one. Check two. So, voice strain. What is it? Now, I um I did a let me just bring up here I did a brr, I'm just bringing up this page here. So I asked this question on the community page of the web uh, of the of the channel um, over, uh, over the weekend, guys. Always check out the community. I, I often try to um, ask a question every now and then, and I can see three hundred and eighty-one of you have have put in a vote. I asked the question, what do you think the greatest contributor to vocal wear and tear is? And uh, so I'm just getting something ready here, guys. What is the greatest contributor to vocal wear and tear? Um, and I asked, working the voice too hard? 50, uh, over half of you think it's working the voice too hard. 22% uh, neglecting, so nearly a quarter, neglecting vocal warm-ups and cool-downs. 13% singing too long, um, too often with vocal rest periods, a lack of genre technique, 5%, and then 4% um, said other. And, and can, I, can I be honest and say, there was, I was kind of a bit of a, bit of a, a leading question, isn't it? What, what is the main contributor to, to vocal wear and tear? Well, do you know what? I probably um, agree with um, some of the comments that are made down lower, and in fact, um, I think, uh, uh, I can't pronounce um, this, the first name here, but I think all of the above, really, and that's probably where I would fall. You know, I th actually think it's probably all of the above is that um, is going to work the voice too hard. We are going to, in fact, we're going to talk about four points along the vocal track development pathway that can lead to vocal wear and tear. Uh, in fact, I'm going to write, I've just thought of another one. I'm going to write, make it five, um, and uh, we're going to talk about that um, as we go along. But I just wanted to, to make note of a few comments down here. Um, and in fact, a, a number of people that have, have, have made a comment have actually said that they think it's all of the above. And you know what? I think it's probably probably the case. I think all of those things that we've just mentioned will, um, will you know, create a little bit of vocal wear and tear. I wanted to show, show off um, Karen's comment and Linda's because they spend so much time. You guys are awesome. Linda and Karen, you always jump on and you, you um, monitor our, our live chat. Um, all of the above, really, Karen says, poor, but poor technique causes premature wear and tear. It's like a vehicle when it's poorly aligned after a while. Many of the parts become stressed and start to wear, then cease functioning. Click and love. Think that's awesome. And then um, multiple reasons for wear and tear of voice, but the greatest one is this one, surely. Oh, okay, so Lin um, Linda's saying that walk the voice too hard. For any muscle or joint in your body, like RSI, repetitive strain injury, that's what causes specific wear and tear. I love that reference to repetitive strain. Um, and uh, tick and love. I love both of those comments. Thank you, ladies. Um, so let's talk about this vocal wear and tear thing. And uh, I'm just going to bring back up my comments here. There's so much really positive conversation going on. Thanks, everyone, for, for that engagement. So what is vocal strain? Well, vocal strain is essentially anything that leaves your voice Feeling, and, 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 and these are very um, uh, non-specific terms, um, but feeling less than optimal after use. So we're not talking vocal fatigue here. It's a matter of determining the difference between what are you experiencing as vocal fatigue and what are you experiencing as, experiencing as vocal strain. 
Every muscle in your body will fatigue with use. The voice is wonderfully resilient and, and can do some amazing mileage, if you like. Uh, but nonetheless, if you are using it in a less than optimal way, then it will um, deteriorate beyond the point of fatigue and go into voice strain, uh, voice strain, which can lead to vocal wear and tear. One of the challenges of, of um, working through vocal strain or wear and tear um, is identifying where is that, what is contributing to that vocal strain. And, and I, as I said, I had written down four, I've now got five. And in fact, I almost certainly, um, you will be able to, if you're watching the show live, um, you'll be able to um, write up some, some ideas beyond what I've come up with. And, uh, and if you're watching the show as a replay, don't hesitate to make a comment and, and add to the list. But I wanted to go through four points. And that is, we have a vocal tract. And the vocal uh, and our voice travels along the vocal tract, yeah? It's produced by the vocal folds, and as the sound is then uh, taken from the vocal folds as a raw product, it's then post-developed post, uh, uh, as it travels along. At a number of different points, strain can develop. Less than optimal settings can be placed. So, the first point is actually below the vocal folds, and we refer to this is the subglottal, submarine under, glottal, glottis being the, the space between the vocal folds in here. Um, and the subglottal point is typically when we think about subglottal issues, we're often referring to um, the, the, uh, the influence is often breath pressure. Uh, and I come from a school of thought that suggests that with contemporary vocals, we've got to be really particular about our breath pressure and monitoring those subglottal pressures to ensure that our what is often a thyroarytenoid dominant activity, a TA muscle activity, or what some voice scientists now are referring to as M1, what you may have referred to as chest voice, making sure that those that that lower register sound that ta dominant activity is not being caused to over engage which then can lead to um, a, a response that is labor intensive so the muscles start to work harder because they're under greater levels of load because they're trying to hold the breath pressure back so that's the first point the first place that we can experience um, vocal wear and tear. The next point is actually above the vocal fold. We refer to this as supraglottal um, uh, positioning or supraglottal issues and that can be with a, a supraglottal squeeze or, or um, constriction uh, and we can sometimes maybe uh, I don't know whether we'd refer to this as a uh, as a uh, you know, two point A. Sometimes we get an A, um, an A piece or an anterior posterior squeeze where there's a a, a a tightening that way. But supraglottal constriction can come about. In fact, I was answering a question on the channel this morning about twang. Um, was it about? Yes, I think it was about twang and the pressures associated with that. One of the and and the twangs come under fire again just in recent months. One of the issues with twang, why I think many people get twang wrong and start to think that it's, a, it's you know, wrecking their voice, when it, again, because there's too much pressure. And so as the, as the sound comes up through the, vo past the vocal folds, well, the sound is created by the vocal folds, comes up through the, up, up into the um, eriepiglottic uh, sleeve or the laryngeopharynx. So there's this space just above the vocal folds being caused by the shaping of the epiglottis. If that's too narrow, if there's too much tightness there, and if there's too much pressure flowing through that, then you are going to get some serious issues. So we're kind of combining two things there, subglottal pressure with supraglottic constriction, muscular response above the vocal folds. A third thing is tongue root tension. And in fact, I see that um, uh, Karen, and you want to go and check out Karen's channel, Singwise um, is her channel. And uh, Karen's been talking about tongue root again. So tongue root is this tendency for the tongue to want to grip back and sit heavy, not only f position itself so it's blocking the back of the throat, the pharynx, 
but also sitting heavy on the larynx and causing a labor intensive um, uh, environment for the, for the larynx. And that too is going to lead to strain. And then we get extrinsic muscular issues. And uh, extrinsic muscular issues is often born out of poor alignment. And so, for example, the guys, uh, us guys can find ourselves jutting the neck forward, the jaw, um, and we can find ourselves not creating a nice buoyant position. Uh, for our body alignment, which can create a whole heap of extrinsic muscular tension, which too is going to hold the larynx in a, a far too rigid position and not keep, leave it, excuse me, leave it free and agile and buoyant to create optimal sound. The fifth one that I hadn't thought about earlier, but I thought about just before, the fifth one is, <laughs> you guys have heard me say this, um, in fact, I'm going to give you a moment. What do you think number five is? I'll give you a hint. I refer to this all the time, in, or more often than not, in many of my pre-record videos. I will give a point to whoever can come up with it first. If you're watching the live show, quickly type in to the, to your, um, the live chat. What do you think number five is that I've written down? It is a bit of a guess what's in Dr. Dan's brain um, question. But quickly, jump in, tell me, what do you think is number five on my list that is going to contribute to vocal strain? It is not one of the answers that I um, made. Let me come back over here for us all. It is not one of, um, it is not one of these. It's, uh, it's something else. It's something that I haven't mentioned um, in, the, in my uh, conversation thus far. I'm going to come back over to my, to my questions. Quickly type in, what, I, what do you think um, is the uh, number five? I won't wait too much longer. I just want to see, I know that the way this mental apprehension no, Simona, but that's a really interesting point. I like the idea of the, yeah, the mental apprehension of can cause you to lock up. And Linda gets it. <laughs> oh, Linda beat, Linda beat you by a smidge, Karen. By a smidge. You both came up at the same time, but we've got to give it to Linda. It's, it's there in black and white. It is. It's hydration. When we are dehydrated, it reduces the lubrication of the vocal folds, which then causes a heightening of um, friction between the vocal folds as they are oscillating. What do we know about an engine part? As engine parts come together and operate together and cogs and all, well, it shows how much I don't know about engines. But what I do know about engines is you do need to have oil in the sump to keep the engine parts lubricated. If you don't have enough oil, it heightens friction, which give, heightens heat, which causes wear and tear. It's exactly the same thing in your voice, only at a biological level, not simply a mechanical level. And it heightens a thing we refer to as phonatory threshold pressure. So th phonatory threshold pressure is the amount of air pressure flow that you need between the vocal folds to maintain oscillation. But if there is a lack of hydration, a lack of lubrication, then you have to work harder with the breath flow to maintain equilibrium of, the, of oscillation, which creates wear and tear. It just means you're not working the voice at an optimal level. And so hydration is definitely another one. Linda is celebrating her win there. <laughs> well done. Cockney, lack of sleep. Yes, belting. Ninja, coming back up to you, Ninja. Um, belting actually shouldn't contribute to wear and tear. If you are doing it well and in a considered manner with good technique, it comes back to the idea that poor technique can contribute to um, vocal wear and tear. But if you are doing these um, methods well, and belt is a, is, a, is, a, is a technical approach or a, a technique that we use in contemporary vocals often, 
um, then it shouldn't, it is a high cost item, it's a high energy item. Yeah, it costs you less to walk one walk a kilometer than it does to run, but that doesn't mean that if you run the kilometer that you get to the end and you've done yourself uh, any damage. If you have, you know, got the fitness and the technique to run that well, um, you're less likely to do yourself any wear and tear if you walk the one kilometer. That being said, you could, if you if your alignment and everything was really out, you could you get the point of the illustration. I hope that's helpful okay and Matt's Matt's saying here singing too high as a as a thing um, for uh, con contributing to vocal wear and tear all of these things let's let's put the, the 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 concept of okay so it's a matter of locating the issue of vocal strain so we just got to be really sensible with our voice world voice day we need to be constantly thinking about and being treating ourselves as vocal athletes using our voice in a um, considered way constantly monitoring how the voice feels and I know many of you who regularly you know visit my channel and hey if this is the first time you've ever joined us here at Voice Essentials we would love for you to subscribe to the channel and 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 uh, and hit that white bell icon so that you're always notified of our live hangouts because we do this you know, so regularly we have a lot of fun and as you can see it's a great group of people here. Um, you know, but those of you who have been here a long time, we, it's a, it, we have talked a lot, haven't we, about being mindful of the voice. And a big part of developing, um, uh, you know, vocal health is being mindful. Mindfulness enables you, being aware of your vocal health or vocal condition, enables you, for example, to go, my voice is starting to just labor a little. I need to rest. I need to give the voice some, some time out and let that, um, that heightened swelling that may have come about by virtue of use just to dissipate. You know, it's often when we ignore those, those signals, those um, signs that, and we just keep powering on that we can run into trouble and that's why I put into that um, questionnaire before um, you know vocal rest it, it is a really important area for your vocal health is to to be able to know when to take a, a back step and go I've got to take a moment off here and the technique obviously developing technique we, we spend so much time here at the channel talking about technique and you guys know and you can see it uh, oh, down here down here, you, if you don't have the CD yet, um, make sure you get a copy. You can download it. There's a link in the the description section below. Um, you know, it's full of technique and development, and of course the 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 channel here. Uh, I've got nearly over 350 videos now, and and the vast majority of them are talking about vocal techniques that you can develop and learn to look after your voice so that you're you're using your voice in an optimal, coordinated considered manner. This is what being a vocalist, you know, crafting the voice is all about, regardless of whether you're avocational or vocational as a singer. Um, and, uh, and this is something that, um, you know, I think, I think, I'll be honest with you, I'd forgotten it was World Voice Day <laughs> until I saw a friend of mine from the UK, a singing voice specialist, um, post um, up onto the up onto her her Twitter feed uh, that it was World Voice Day. I thought, well, this is the perfect subject today to be talking about for World Voice Day here on the live chat. I hope that's been helpful, everyone. Um, we are going to go to some Q and A now and uh, come back and and just finish off with the answer by answering a couple of your questions. I, I there was one question right back up at the top, which we're going to go over to. Um, right, right back here at the beginning. But for now, let me just quickly go to this. Okay, so I wonder whether this will... No, that's not the page I want, everyone. Let me just... This will be the page I want, just so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just coming back up to here 
because I saw James, in fact, I don't know whether James is still with us, but hopefully he'll see this at a later time. I'm waiting for Dr. Dan because I need help. This live will save my problem. Well, I, 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 I'm no messiah, James. Well, let's see what we can do. I can feel too much pressure. Once I give low pressure, it makes my throat hurt. Interesting point. So much of what I've just said, um, we talk about, we, we do get into the habit, don't we, of thinking about over driving the voice, you know, too much pressure, too much oomph. It's a funny thing. You know, this, this term I keep using, and I've used it all of today, is optimal setting. So we talk about too much, but do you know what? The voice can be quite labored by having not enough, yeah? So by having too little pressure, your muscles have to work harder to account for the fact that they're not quite getting the airflow, and so they're trying to do the work. They start to create tension and tightness, which is all because there's not enough air pressure. We're not aiming for too little. We're not aiming for too much. We're aiming for, well, that was, I don't know which way I'm going now. We're aiming for the optimal, just right, just the right amount. And learning to develop that takes time. And, uh, and I hope you've been watching the, the series on the Wednesday series that we've got going at the moment. There's part, it's a two-part series. Last week we talked about the responsibilities of the teacher. This week we're talking about the responsibilities of the student. Part of what I'm wanting to again communicate is learning to sing. Look, this YouTube channel, we've created a great community here and we will continue to do that. And I'm going to continue to upload videos for you all. But, but can I once again stress to you how important individual lessons are. They are so important. You will reach, every person will reach a, a plateau in their learning if they only have YouTube to teach them. Yeah, because YouTube can't diagnose faults. It can't give, give feedback. It cannot tell you when you're doing it wrong. The only way you can do that is when you are in lesson with another human being, a trained, ex, you know, uh, professional singing teacher with expertise who can go, hey, did you hear what you just did there? That was good. Or, oh, we need to tweak that. Can we do that again? Can we change that? You need to pay attention. So it's so important that, that you do that. And if you're looking to develop, you know, good breath flow and good breath pressure, then doing that in team with another singing teacher is a good thing. Coming down, so that was right back of a throw. I'm going to come all the way down. If you've got questions, everyone, now's the time to be asking them. Uh, Matt's, Matt is enjoying my, my shirt. Yes, it's join, join the dark side. I'm not really a dark side kind of guy. I am a bit of a light side kind of guy, but nonetheless, it's, I do like the, the shirt. I've got quite a number of Star Wars type shirts you'll have noticed. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, Alexandra, uh, is it possible for a tenor to struggle with E flat? E flat four. Um, mm, well, I, I would say uh, my answer to that is, is yes. Of course, it's, it's, it's possible for a tenor to struggle with an E flat four. Um, I would then go exploring why are you struggling with an E flat four if you are a tenor. Um, and, you know, I've said to you guys many times before, I don't get really hung up on voice classification. Um, I think it has its place, but in contemporary vocals, it's, it's, it's rather limited. Um, and, 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 but I can, I can also tell you that more often than not, in my humble opinion, a lot of students who step into my studio, when we, when we do look at the voice classification in the orientation and analysis, they're, often they've classified themselves or someone else has classified them incorrectly. And what that does is it leads you into this psychological box that can have all these blockages with it. And so, you know, I, 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 I guess I, I, I don't, I, I can't question right now whether you're a tenor, but if you were, then E flat four shouldn't be a challenge, and I would be looking to develop your technique and work at that um, a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to give you a question today, Matt, because I think I gave you a couple the other day. Um, 
despite the fact that you showed me how to pronounce your, your last name up here, Malacachio, 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 Matt Malacachio. There you go. I think I've I think I've got that right. Coming down. Um, uh, I'm going to come all the way down the bottom to see if we've got any questions popping up for us. Gee, you guys are active on the live chat today. Awesome. Okay, I'm searching for a question. Singwise Karen, I dare you to wear that shirt to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> Karen, already done. Tick. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm sure there are a number of people who will be praying for me as the fact that I have a ponytail and I'm male and I do wear a hat in the building. I've had comments, received comments, I accept them and I go on with my life. Uh, dear. So, dare accepted and completed, Karen. Um, uh, Bassett Studio is saying finding a quality teacher, speech therapist, also important, absolutely. Um, and uh, just looking, um, uh, Alan, Alan GC, oh, okay, this is a question to Ninja. Okay, last one for Cockney, who is a long-term subscriber to the channel. So we'll give Cockney the last one here. I was asking Dan, how common are nodes and other vocal pathologies, please? Whoa, interesting question. Uh, how common are they? Do you know what? I think they're more common than we realize. And I think also, let me just bring this back over here, everyone. I think also, not only are they common, but I think, for example, with nodules, they are, they get more attention than they're worth. I think many working singers uh, in their careers, and I, I, would, I would venture to say, I think I possibly have had, at the very least, soft swellings, so soft nodules, um, and uh, that have resolved by virtue of, of self-imposed rest. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm talking about very early back in my career, especially when I was touring. I've toured with a band. We did over 400 shows, the Eastern Seaboard of Australia, my first year out of high school. And I'm, I'm fairly convinced I came out the other end of that because I really didn't know what I was doing. I came out the other end of that with a voice that was in pretty... It was in disrepair. I would venture to think that I almost certainly had some form of nodular swelling. Um, if not, then I, I had other things going on. Um, so I think they're more common, um, Cockney, than, than we give them credit. That being said, they, deserve, they, they, they receive more credit these days than they were. So back in the early 90s when I was touring the band, nodules were still considered a very difficult thing to, to um, remediate. Um, now, bread and butter stuff. The, we, it's you know, I have people in my studio on a regular basis where we are rehabilitating nodules, and it's kind of, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's not something that I view as a, a big challenge. Um, other pathologies uh, like vocal fold hemorrhage, uh, polyp, cyst. Um, it's these are or paralysis. Uh, these are all issues that um, require very specific response. We deal with them all very differently, um, and we respond to them, you know, very differently. And dependent on what the client or the, you know, in the case of medic, the medicos, the patient requires. If, for example, a vocal, uh, a, 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 a professional singer, a vocational singer, has a, a vocal fold hemorrhage, it may well be beneficial to um, to clean that out um, surgically, follow that up with voice therapy, whether it be speech and/or singing therapy, um, to get them back up and running as soon as we can possibly do. 
Obviously, the benefits of continuing voice therapy post-surgery are very high because we want to ensure that the voice doesn't deteriorate by virtue of wear and tear into that space again. Uh, but the, not, the, the avocational singer, the non-vocational singer, we can take a little bit longer. And so sometimes it's not necessary to go the surgical route because we have a little bit more time on our, up our sleeves. But for example, with the vocal fold cyst, there is, you know, like a, a fluid retention cyst, you've got to really remove those. Um, with uh, with surgery, they don't they 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 typically don't come about. A cyst doesn't come about because of any um, necessary uh, vocal abuse necessarily. They can just develop. And so um, the thing with a cyst, though, a fluid retention cyst, uh, that will often develop uh, within the Reinke space between the the epithelium and the uh, the superficial um, lamina propria, it just in that space there. Um, the, the, the cyst with use will, will, f will flood with, with fluid and fill up like a big sack. But then as the voice rests, the fluid um, is released from the sack. But, and so the, the singer can be fooled into thinking, oh, the voice is okay now. Actually, it's not because the next time the person places load under the voice, the fluid, just the sack refills. The only way to really deal with that is surgical. So what I guess I'm saying is that you, you've got to respond to these issues in accordance with what the vocal pathology is, which is, and this, I'm going to finish, this is a good good question to finish the day on because it, it is such a world voice day type question. This is why it is so important that if you have got vocal concerns that have not alleviated after a period of two to three weeks, you know, just with general rest, and the voice has not returned to what you know to be its um, middle setting of vocal health, you know, where you know, yeah, the voice is in good condition, this is what it should do. If after two to three weeks it has not returned to that point, can I encourage you, you must go to a laryngologist. Uh, uh, hopefully you can find uh, even an ear, nose and throat doctor that can um, scope the voice, whether it be with a fixed scope through the mouth or up through the nasal cavity and down onto the vocal folds, to have a look at the pathology because many of these pathologies that I'm mentioning, many of them evidence themselves acoustically in a very similar way. They all have their own nuances, but sometimes, here's the thing, sometimes the pathology doesn't even interrupt in the, with the leading edge of the vocal fold, and so they can be disguised. Now, you might get to the ENT and the ENT go, no, there's nothing wrong, there's no pathology. Then you need to investigate the functional aspect of the voice. Um, but nonetheless, you don't want to proceed with your vocal loads without knowing why has my voice not returned to health in the last uh, couple of weeks. Investigate it. Please do not stick your head in a bucket of sand. Living in denial won't make it better. Your vocal continuance, um, at a healthy level is reliant on you being brave and going to an ear, nose and throat doctor, preferably a laryngologist, a specialist in um, voice uh, where they can actually have a look. I cannot diagnose you, a speech therapist, a speech pathologist cannot diagnose you. We can only lead you to an ear, uh, ear nose and throat doctor a, or a laryngologist who will then either refer you back to myself, a singing voice specialist or a speech pathologist, and or recommend surgical intervention if that is necessary. Wow, there you go. I, I think that was a good World Voice Day live hangout. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I hope uh, we've covered, well, gee, we've covered some ground today, haven't we? I love that last question. Do you know what? I, I love the area of, um, well, it's, it's a singing voice specialist kind of thing. I, I love rehabilitating uh, voices that are unwell. I hope you've enjoyed the live hangout. There's been so much wonderful discussion. Thanks for hanging out, everyone. Again, if this is the first time you've ever joined us here at the live, uh, on the live hangout, please subscribe to the channel. If you're interested, jump over to the channel, 350 odd videos crazy amount of 
um, online tutelage there that you can take advantage of. It's all free. I hope you will. I hope you'll hit the white bell icon because that way you'll always be notified of when we're hanging out together. And of course, I look forward to seeing you in the next Voice Essentials video. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.